Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we live in a world of trials. Just turn on the television and you can see all kinds of major trials. Throughout the last several decades, we've seen all kinds of things unfolding before our eyes on television. O.J. Simpson, Timothy McVeigh, the Unabomber. Later on, there was even celebrities who were brought to trial, Michael Jackson, uh, and all kinds of other, even recent times. We've got all kinds of examples of television becoming part of the courtroom. There's even courtroom TV. And it's interesting how television has turned trials into drama. It's not really about the facts sometimes, it's really how the reporters talk to the family members and they talk to the lawyers and try, try to figure out the strategies. They're looking at the emotions of the people, intentions of the witnesses, trying to figure out the biases of the judges. There's not a whole lot of impartial observation anymore. A clear statement of the facts is not interesting in, uh, for those kinds of courtroom reporters. And as a result, we see that the victims are often sobbing out their stories outside the courtroom for all to see so that you and I might become the judges. Taking facts into account has been overrun by our feelings about cases. And since this is the way the trials appear today, we might think that the way that the Bible would show the trial of Jesus would be far different. After all, there were no television uh, cameras in the courtroom when Jesus was being tried by the Sanhedrin and even by Pontius Pilate. So why? would we have the kind of emotional expression in the account that Mark gives us today? Because Mark does give us those behind the scene movements. Mark gives us the details about Barabbas, about Simon of Cyrene, the centurion at the cross at the end of our long reading on the Passion today. Why does Mark spend so much time on the drama? Isn't that something that we should ignore? Shouldn't it just be the facts? Isn't this a trial and Jesus is innocent? But there's another reason. Another reason why Mark gives us the details he does. Because the idea that Jesus, whether or not he's innocent or guilty, isn't even a consideration for the Gospels. The Bible has given all the evidence long before the trial ever came about. Jesus is the innocent Lamb of God. We don't need to talk about whether or not he's guilty or not. And so the dramatic details that we see in the text, the compromise of the truth when Barabbas is released, the chief priests and the teachers mocking Jesus on the cross, even when Jesus is thirsty, they offer him wine vinegar, no relief for this innocent victim. We see that through all these things, Mark is giving us a picture that has a different reason behind it. He's not trying to play on our emotions. He's not trying to move unbelievers to believe that Jesus is the Messiah simply because look at how unfairly he was treated. Instead, Mark is teaching us about changing human will. You see, in the details of this text, there is another drama unfolding. It's the drama of humanity. You and I are on trial. Humanity is revealed for what we are. Jesus is the perfect Son of God. His love for humanity is seen by the fact that he was willing to be born into this world, as we read from 
Philippians chapter 2, he was equal with God, but did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, becoming a servant, to be born to die. And so this description in our text isn't about the drama, but it's about the reality of who you and I are. Look at how quickly the disciples fell away. Peter, talking for all the disciples, is saying, I will never fall away. Even if everybody else falls away, I would never do that. How often do we believe that we'll be faithful to Jesus? That we'll carry out his will, that we love him, we want to do what he asks us to do, and yet we fail him over and over again. Our own sins unfolding as Peter's did when he heard the rooster crow that second time. And just as Jesus had prophesied, you will deny me three times by then. The guilt that may come upon us for the recognition of our own sin is necessary because it is a part of the law that does its work in preparing our hearts, preparing us to receive the innocent Son of God that we might know that He is our solution, that He is our Savior, that He is the one who came to save us. How everyone should have expected the Messiah to come to save them and yet rejected him is amazing. But what's even more amazing is that the one person who declares Jesus to be the Son of God isn't even a Jewish person. It's the centurion at the end of our text in Matthew, Mark 15, who proclaims, surely this was the Son of God. How does he come to this conclusion? Because of his shock at the person he's executing doesn't condemn anybody, isn't angry, isn't vicious or lashing out. He breathes his last and places his soul into the hands of the Father. Jesus Christ and his death are the most unusual thing that anyone has ever seen, and it moved that man, that centurion, to faith. What I think is really happening here is kind of a way that we sometimes recognize ourselves in situations that we weren't aware of. That's what Mark is doing. Have you ever looked out a window? Maybe when you had younger kids, or you were looking out at some kids playing on the street, and you look out the window and you see them and you're waving to them, you want to let them know that you're going to be leaving or something, and suddenly you see your own reflection in that window that you're looking out of. And suddenly you're kind of caught with this recognition that you haven't been around, you've been working so hard, you haven't been with the kids, and you see yourself getting ready to leave again or to do some more work or whatever it is that you're moving on to and you realize that you haven't been the parent you wanted to be, you haven't been there for the kids as much as you wish you have, and you're wondering, what am I doing? What's important? What are my priorities? And then you realize that the kids are really okay. They're out there playing soccer. They're doing their thing. And you're still looking within. It's just a play of the light, seeing your reflection in the mirror that you're looking out of, or the, the window that is, but it causes you to consider yourself, checking within, noticing what is going through your mind and what you wish you might have done. So Mark is recording the trial like a window He causes us to see ourselves by a work of the light, to recognize that this trial isn't about Jesus as much as it is about the fallen world. It's a trial of us. We fail. We fall short. We put Jesus on that cross. And even though we, as Christians and believers who love the Lord, 
We know the truth. Our sin put him there. But Jesus didn't go unwillingly. He went there out of love. And so Mark teaches us also about the eternal will of God. He's teaching us about how Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. Jesus' love is seen in the way that he reaches out to a world that is hurting and that is dying. And even in his own death, he knows that this is the solution. He knows that this is the only way he can make things right. You see, Jesus loved the Father too much to save himself. He was willing to do the Father's will, which is to be the payment for the sins of the world. But he also loved you too much to save himself. The other people were taunting Jesus when he was there on the cross. You can see how quickly as we started our service with the Palm Sunday entry, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, how those people, many of them who probably had said Hosanna to Jesus, were now proclaiming crucify him. Why did they change so quickly? We don't know if it was the exact same people, but we know that humanity is fickle. We know that even our own lives are going back and forth when it comes to wanting to serve Jesus and then just trying to serve ourselves in the way that we live and the way that we act. But we know that Jesus loves you the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. He didn't just go to that cross to pay for the sins of the world, but he wanted to make sure that somebody like Peter, who had denied Jesus, would come to realize that Jesus went to that cross so that that denial would be paid for. That Peter may know the love of Christ. That's why we're here in church. That's why we come to the Lord's house. So we can hear that good news. Yes, this is Passion Sunday. And yes, the trial of Jesus is gory. And yes, sometimes it's something that our world doesn't want to hear. And yet we know that that is the answer to God's will. That he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus had to die. Jesus had to pay the price for our sins. Jesus had to reconcile us with God so that in God's sight, we are no longer the sinners, the deniers, the betrayers. We are God's children. What an amazing turn of events. Something that boggles the human mind, so much so that humans often struggle with this idea that how would God, if he's really a loving God, why would he let his own son die? It doesn't make sense. There's even a description of that whole idea that plays out even to this day between Judaism and Christianity. Many of you have heard of Elie Wiesel, the survivor of the Holocaust, who's written many books. And Elie Wiesel writes in a book called Messengers of God. He talks about the difference between Judaism and Christianity by comparing two mountains that rise in each religion. And for Judaism, the important mountain is Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham bound his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice that God was testing him. And he says, uh, Elie Wiesel says in his book, that God was testing Abraham as he went up to that mountain, but after he puts the wood on the altar and he bounds his son and he raises the knife, God intervenes and he doesn't kill his son. Instead, they offer up a ram caught in the thicket from Genesis 22. He goes on to write that Christianity, on the other hand, puts the important mountain as Golgotha, where according to tradition, to tradition, another father bound his son, put him on that wood, and instead killed him. And, you know, it's true that that's a difference, and he says that for Jews, all truth must spring from life, never from death. But I beg to differ. He didn't quite understand the meaning behind it. Yes, it's 
hard to reconcile how Abraham didn't go through with that. But you see, God only told Abraham to sacrifice his son to let him know how difficult it would be because God wouldn't ask Abraham or any of us to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. And so the Christian story does not end with Golgotha. It does not end with God sacrificing his own son. It does not end with death. Yes, there is a reenactment of the story of Abraham in Christianity, but this time, Jesus is the ram, and you and I are Isaac, set free, spared, alive. And Christ comes back from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, the lamb who was sacrificed on our behalf, that we might become the children of God, and Jesus is the first fruits of those who are raised from the dead. And so I think that he got it wrong, obviously, because in Christianity is not a religion that springs from death. It springs from life. It springs from the resurrection. It springs from Jesus Christ who brings about new life. And God's will is still bringing about new life. Think about what God did in this text. The first Gentile convert, the centurion coming to faith in Mark's gospel, and how Jesus honors the women who were there at the at the cross, appearing to them at the resurrection before anybody else, which, again, when it comes to trials and courtroom scenes, would be unheard of because the women's testimony in Roman law and Jewish law would not have even been accepted. Jesus continues to convert unlikely people. He continues to work in the world to honor the poor, to bring about help and life for the powerless which includes you and me, because we're powerless to stop sinning. But through Jesus Christ, our sin is overcome. New life begins in Jesus Christ. And so the miracle of the trial of Jesus isn't so much that it shows humanity as sinners, but it shows that we need a Savior, and Jesus is the one who came to be that Savior. Jesus is the one who proclaims the end of the greatest trial in history because it goes on all the time. We're always on trial before God because of our sin, but the verdict continues to be proclaimed not guilty when we come to hear the word of the Lord and our confession and our baptism in communion. You have been declared not guilty because of Jesus' death. This Passion Sunday is just the prelude for the rest of Holy Week, a week that for some Christians may be something that they're not ready and willing to do, go through because why don't we just skip to the good part? Why don't we just go from Palm Sunday to Easter? But the middle part is important. The gospel spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' death and at his uh, trial and his death. And the reason is because we need to remember. We need to remember the great love, the depth of Christ's willingness to save us. And in doing so, the depth of our life that has been redeemed. For nothing is impossible with God even sin will not separate us from him. If Jesus, if God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us all things? That is what makes us rejoice. On Passion Week, at the crucifixion, and at the resurrection, Jesus is Lord, and he took your place so that you may live. In Jesus' name, amen.